Paul Taubman with Nine Dot Connects. Thank you very much, very much for joining us here today. So we're going to get on with it here because we have quite a bit to show you. Our demonstration, or actually our webinar, is going to be on uh, the power distribution network, and uh, we're going to talk uh, quite a bit about that. Just a quick 30 seconds about us. We are Nine Dot Connects. Uh, we are very PCB centric. We certainly provide tools uh, that are in the PCB domain. We also provide a number of different services. Layout is our specialty, but we also do provide consulting services for designs and also contract manufacturing, or we call it assist, contract manufacturing assistance as part of the layout. So if you're having some issues with it or you've got a layout and you say, great, what's the next step? We can certainly uh, assist you with that, especially if we're also doing some test work for you as well. The tool that I'm going to be using is from a company called In Circuit Design. It is the layer, uh, pardon me, it's the power manager tool that we'll be taking a look at. Last month when we did our presentation on stack ups, we showed the layer stack up aspect of the tool, but today we're going to uh, use the power manager tool in context of what we're going to talk about today. So this is not just a demonstration of ICD's tool, it is really showing the tool in the context of power distribution uh, networks. All right, so with that, I want to kind of uh, give you um, a different perspective on things. So why is this really important? Well, interestingly enough, in my own career, it was important because it helped me land a job back in 2002 after the tech wreck. Um, and the Raptor, believe it or not, is kind of near and dear to me because that was a part of that particular job. And the story I'm going to tell you really has to do about power. And so the company I was working for at the time was building the radio uh, for this particular aircraft. And um, they were having some problems with that particular radio. They had built a really high, high tech lab. They had put in all these wonderful power supplies. They really got this radio working in a phenomenal state. And then they shipped it on off to the uh, to Edwards Air Force Base to uh, start testing it. And uh, sure enough, uh, it was glitching. And they were having a lot of problems with the radio. And it would kick off in mid-flight. And of course, these are all intermittent. And that caused a lot of problems. So there was a big investigation that had to be done with this, a lot of finger pointing, obviously, with something uh, of this nature. And uh, ultimately, was brought on as a part of a team to help uh, figure out what was going on. Well, eventually what would ha had happened was that this radio was being subjected to a very dirty power environment. And we had built the radio so that it was working in a very clean power environment. So we actually completely kind of misread what we needed to do when it came to building the radio. Now, the airframe maker has to be the one who provides the clean power, but unbeknownst to us, and you've got to remember projects this large, have multiple companies, multiple, multiple subcontractors, thousands of employees who are working these things, but they had kind of forgot to tell us that the several power filters had been removed from the aircraft due to weight. Obviously, weight's a big factor in any type of aircraft. So since we didn't know about that, uh, we were actually subjected to a very dirty power environment. So the reason I think this is near and dear, not only to me, but so important, is because a lot of times we focus our boards on, well, we got to get this through UL, or we got to get this through uh, CE or some other type of standard. And so we spent a lot of time providing it clean power just to make sure that our board is doing the way or acting the way it should. But really, we got to take it one step beyond that. Not only should it be working when it's given clean power, it also means that we've got to build it for an environment that is not going to provide it clean power as well. And one thing I'll just kind of recommend to any of you out there, um, if there's something to walk away with here today, if anything else, is that if you've worked on your projects and they're working really well in the lab and they're starting to fail out in the field several months later, um, I put my money down on taking a look at the power environment uh, that it's being exposed to uh, because you may have not designed it to the environments uh, that it's being operated in. So that's uh, just uh, my introduction to that. Let's get on with it here. PDNs, Power Distribution Network. I've also seen PDN uh, as an acronym is Power Distributive Network as well. It's an actually a relatively new term. I have not seen a lot of companies uh, use it per se. Um, ICD, uh, in particular, Barry only uh, uses it quite often in his articles that he writes uh, for, um, I think, uh, PCB triple, uh, probably 007. So it's a relatively new term. I do like it. And I think that as power becomes a more of a prevalent issue, we're going to see it more and more. The fact of the matter is, is that the power distribution network is something we've always had. It's just basically our power and our ground. But we've got to look at it from a very different perspective, especially in high-speed design, because everything that's involved with this um, has the potential of causing noise or has the potential of being impacted by the noise that is placed on the power distribution network. So you can see it's pretty much everything that you put on the printed circuit board, including the printed circuit board itself. Okay. 
So before we kind of go too deep into all the issues that we have in it, let's talk about the ideal power distribution network, or it, in particular its environment. First and foremost, it provides a constant DC power to all the loads. And I always find the term load kind of interesting because when we talk about loads, we are really talking about the components on there, right? It's more than just a cloud of logic. It's more than just the R sub L uh, that we always put at the end of some type of circuit that we're analyzing. It's all of the components that we have on there. And the fact of the matter is we want to have an environment in which if our components need power, they can draw it immediately and that there's no issues with it, right? And the analogy I give over here is if this is a reservoir to some large metropolitan city, that when we turn on our taps, we expect that whatever hour, whether it's midnight or 12 noon, and any hour in between, when we turn our taps on, that water is going to come out, and it's going to come out with a certain pressure. And that's kind of the same expectation that we have when it comes to our, our power planes, or our, our, our PDN, if we want to call it that. The second thing is, is that there is zero AC impedance between the power and ground. AC impedance is a really nice way of, or just AC uh, uh, voltages on our power planes, or it's just a nice way of saying noise. Okay? It's something that's going up and down, and on our planes, you want to have a, a flat voltage on them. And anything that's going above and below that, uh, in, regardless of its frequency, is AC, and that, no, that AC is a noise. We don't want it on there. We want to get it out of there. So even if we're providing the perfect environment, the outside environment may be putting this noise on there. And we want to have a zero path for AC between power and ground. The last thing is that there's no AC noise voltage from the load itself, that the loads are acting uh, very well. They're taking what they need. And when they're putting stuff out on their output, that they're not somehow interrupting the power distribution network. Now, the reality of the board is this. This is the board itself before we put really anything on it, especially in high-speed designs. And so what are you looking at here? We're looking at inductors, capacitors, or let's say inductances, capacitances, and resistances here as well. What this is basically telling us is that there are indeed impedances, and those impedances are going to play a big role, especially when we get into high-speed design. So our idea of everything being perfectly ideal is really kind of thrown out the door. The one big thing, and I got you'll hear this several times in today's conversation, is that all materials have a resistance. And because they have a resistance, they're going to have an impedance. And, and of course, there's two aspects of the impedance, and I'll go into that a little bit later on. But again, just remember that resistance is a bigger part of the picture of impedance itself. Impedance is reactance and resistance. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along here. But because of that, we have to start looking at things from a very realistic perspective. So the reality of the power supplies is that they can be noisy. Okay? Uh, and how can they be noisy? Well, if we're doing AC rectification, even though the AC is known, it's not some stray noise that's coming out of nowhere, it is considered to be a noise because of the fact that it's going up and down. It's going from the positive to the negative. And even as we're rectifying it, we're putting it through possibly a Wheatstone bridge or something else, and we're flipping that uh, particular uh, signals from it going from the minus to the plus, we're still getting a bunch of bumps. And we've got to smooth out those bumps uh, with the capacitors and so on and so forth so that eventually, once it leaves our power supply area, it's going to be DC. There's going to be ripple. There's going to be ripple due to charging and discharging. There's going to be switching that's going on. And there's also going to be ripple due to the regulation effects as well. Why is that? Well, because we're dealing with feedback loops. And when you're dealing with a feedback loop, there's always some level of hysteresis. You're going to continue to go up, up, up. You're going to hit something, and then you're going to kind of come down a little bit. Then you can hit something again, you come back up. So you're going to kind of get this ripple or this float. And you want to keep that as minimal as possible. Right? And obviously, that's one of the things we want to do. Now, beyond that, once we've handled this, uh, vol these voltage sources, here, the reality of the power supply is this, that whatever we put out, we want it to be clean. We don't want to start off with something dirty. But once we put it out there, there's no guarantee that this clean power that we've created is going to find its way to the components uh, on the board. Now, what do I mean by that? And this is kind of another analogy and example here. Here's an area that's got some pretty tranquil water. And beyond these rocks over here, we have our, uh, we have our open bay. And in this particular bay over here, you've got some, you know, you've got some rougher seas here. So if you can imagine, using this analogy, that this mountain over here is our, our component. And over here, we're actually putting out, let's say, clean water, uh, water that's tranquil, water that may be purified. And we put it out over here into our bay, or basically onto the board over here. Well, it's going to be subjected to things. right? And so that the water that we create here, purified, or put out in a tranquil state, 
by the time it if it gets over to this particular component on the other side of the bay, it's going to be subjected to the weather and the wind. And if there's contaminants there, it's maybe going to mix in with the contaminants. So that's the idea that uh, the, or the analogy I'm trying to put out there is that, yes, you want to put out stuff that's clean on your power supplies, but there's no guarantee it's going to get, uh, it's going to arrive at the load in a clean manner. Okay? So that's just something to keep in mind. Now, the, the loads themselves have some issues that are, uh, that we need to address. So first and foremost, uh, we have to keep in mind that the loads can pull down the powder di power distribution network. Um, and it, it, we see this again in high speed. High speed just causes a number of different things to happen that we just really didn't have to worry about in the lower speeds. But things like, for example, the logic switching. And let's talk about this one here for a moment. If you're not familiar with this, you're going to get a very, very brief introduction course to uh, VLSI, a very large scale uh, integration that's what they use in the chips. And what you see over here is a, a MOS or CMOS uh, configuration. You have an input, you have an output. And when the input comes in over here, it's usually some value. And as a result of it, one's going to be turned on, one's going to be turned off. So if this is turned off over here, so let's say we're putting a logic one into this. This is off, this is one. The output is going to drain out, and it's going to be a zero. So this is actually an inverter. On the D, VDD side, or let's say we flip this around, and now we put a zero here. This gets turned on, this gets turned off, and now the, the output is going to get charged up because we're allowing the voltage to go through. Well, what happens during switching? What happens during the switching time is that we don't, because we're trying to switch at such fast speeds, the last thing that we want to do is wait for one to turn off and then turn the other one on. There is always a bit of an overlap where one is turning off, the other one is turning on, and that certainly helps with the, the signal transitions. But during that period of time when they're both on, you're going to basically get what's called a shoot through. So you are going to uh, basically short out the, the circuit for a very short, brief period of time. Now you may be saying to yourself, well, this is just one out of a million of these things. But the fact of the matter is most of these chips do have well over a million of these things. And we're, at high speeds, we are turn, we're, we're basically switching these things on and off well over, a million, I'd say, several billion times a second. So uh, this has an accumulative effect, and it's always going to draw down on the PDN. So that's why your larger components tend to be a little more power hungry. In addition to that, if you had an unintended floating signal, you left an input that left floating open, uh, these are things that shouldn't be done. I'd call them freshman mistakes. Uh, the ERC checker in Alpine would certainly pick up on that. And as long as you're looking at your messages and uh, reviewing those things, uh, this should be um, avoided at all costs. The, you know, the example for that is that, you know, assuming let's put the, the water bill aside, but you have a massive reservoir and you turn on a spigot and you leave it running for 100 years, are you going to drain the reservoir? The answer is no, okay, but that's just a waste. And there's no reason to just leave it, turn on a spigot and just watch it go down the drain. Same thing over here. Let's not create more reasons to pull on the power distribution network, especially if it doesn't have a purpose. The third reason is current demands on termination, pull-ups and pull-downs. Right? So we can use those things, and obviously the, the value of the resistor that we use for those is going to play a big role in that. But the fact of the matter is that they're always going to be pulling on it uh, at, at one way or another. So these are the things that are going to constantly pull on the power distribution network. They're not going to, these chips are not idle. They're always bouncing around. They're always doing things. And unless they're put in some type of sleep mode, you can expect them to pull on the distribution network. All right, the second aspect, so one thing we've talked about is how they're pulling down on the loads, pardon, how the loads are pulling down on the PDN. The second aspect of it is the fact that they're adding noise to it as well. So again, just to remind everybody that we're talking, when we talk about loads, we're talking about components here. These loads add AC noise to the power distribution network. So when we look at this over here again, and I, uh, when we go through these transition points, what happens, especially in high-speed design, and this is where we see the noise, is that in high-speed design, these things really pull hard on each other, right? Those sharp rising edges, they're really, really pulling hard on these gates. So it's not just a trickle in and a trickle out. These things are generally designed, and of course, I'm, not, I'm showing the ultra, the ultra rudimentary view of this, but they probably have a lot more here to, to allow for fast switching. These things can pull so quickly that the, air, that the local area where that VDD is will actually drop down. And conversely, it can be pulling down so hard that it can actually bring the VSS up. So you actually get, as a result, a lower VDD and a possible higher VSS, and that shows up as noise. And that's exactly what you're seeing over here in this particular example. So this one over here has a tremendous amount of overshoot. And the article that this came from, they did that on purpose to really drive home the point 
that when you're putting together something like a synthetic signal that's got all these different uh, waves to it, especially higher frequencies, um, right? It, that's what you're going to get over here, and those frequencies are not only going to cause whatever signal integrity issues you might have in your lines, but in just pulling this whole thing together, you're also going to see these things on your power distribution network as well. So you're not only pulling down on the power distribution network, you're creating noise on the power distribution network. And those are things that we have to address in high-speed design. So how do we address these things? Well, first and foremost, let's talk about the idea of storing and releasing power. Let's go back to our example of the reservoir. So most municipal cities aren't just going to have one super large pipe that just pulls from the reservoir and just branches it off to all the residential homes or businesses. They're going to have basically, they're going to have stations that are going to pump them into tanks. And those tanks are going to help regulate the local areas, the business areas, or those neighborhoods. Uh, so we want to do the same thing on our boards as well. We want to put basically storage tanks near our, our loads. We want to put storage tanks near our, our power supplies so that if we do if we do have to provide that extra push on our power, on our overall power planes, we can do so. And there's really two ways to do this. The first one is the regulator. And we should have regulators on our board, at least one, actually usually just one, because regulators are phenomenal at handling low frequency stuff that could be on the plane, up to about one megahertz. But that's really the only reason why you put one of these on here. I'm talking to my colleague about this. Yeah, I suppose we could put on multiple regulators, but it doesn't address the bypass issues that we need. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's one thing to store. It's another thing to help filter. And you'll see this. Uh, that's the second objective that we'll talk about. But these, uh, these regulators, unfortunately, only handle up to one megahertz. And obviously, we're working in the hundreds of megahertz in high-speed design. So putting a bunch of regulators on the board isn't going to, it, it may help out with the storage, but it certainly is not going to help out uh, with the, the filtering aspects of it. So the other thing we've got here are capacitors. And capacitors do really well at helping to mitigate the impedances and, the, and basically the noises that we see on the boards at much higher frequencies. I mean, it's, it's really as high as in the gigahertz range. Okay? And also, we have a number of placement options. And we have a number of different sizes we can work with as well. So our first plan of action is, how do we get these capacitors? Where do we need to put them? And we'll spend a lot more time on this as we progress through this webinar. The second objective here is to filter out the noise. And we have to keep in mind we're filtering out noise from not only the board itself, but from sources outside of the board. Right? It goes back to that very first slide we talked about with the aircraft. How do we do this? Well, we could probably plaster the entire board with capacitors all over the place and somehow try to do it that way. But really, the best thing to do is to handle it first at the power source to make sure, again, we have power that's clean coming out, and secondly, at the load where not only removing noise coming into the load, but suppressing the noise from the load as well. And that's why I generally see, and if you never really thought about it, the question is, why do we always put these capacitors near these components? Why do we always put them here, uh, these capacitors near the power supply? It's just because we're primarily trying to filter out noise. And the closer you keep these things to the load, all the better. Okay. How are we going to accomplish this? Well, we're going to obviously use capacitors. And there's two types of capacitors. And one is kind of called. And these names are kind of loosey-goosey. There's no definitive, um, hey, between this, this value and this value, these are bulk, and these other ones are called decoupling ca capacitors. These are just kind of general values, and they're just given these names based on their values. So those caps that are near or above uh, 10 microfarads or larger are bulk capacitors. They call them bulk capacitors. And anything that's much smaller than 0.1 microfarad is called the decoupling caps. And we really do need to use both of these, uh, primarily the decoupling caps, because number one, the lows don't need that much power to them. And secondly, there's um, higher frequency. They can handle the higher frequencies. And we'll see this in examples that I'll show here in, in a few minutes. OK. Obviously, if we're going to use capacitors, there's some questions we got to ask. So how many farads per capacitor? Where are we going to put them? We've kind of answered this already in the last slide, and how many uh, of them. But these, the first and the third point, uh, we do want to spend some time uh, thinking about over here. Now, I want to take you through this because I think it's important to understand that we just don't want to pull capacitors from anywhere. There's so many different capacitor types out there. And we, um, you, you know, it, what, which ones you want to pick, which ones you want to decide, it's kind of tough. And But I think if we kind of take this from a different perspective, you may see why we need to use bulk capacitors for certain things and why we use decoupling capacitors for another. 
But let's start off again with an ideal situation for storage. Again, this is ideal. And where we can start off with is the charge itself, because this is the most fundamental equation. Q equals CV for a capacitor, where obviously the Q is the charge, C is the capacitance, and V is the voltage. So in storage, we obviously want more storage, right? Because then we can handle bigger demands. At least that's the logic behind it. So the V is obviously going to be fixed. If we need 5 volts, we're not going to bring it up to 6 volts or 7 volts. We've got to leave it at 5 volts. So if we want a larger charge, then it makes sense that, in theory, a larger capacitance would be ideal. Okay? Now let's also talk about the filtering. So again, these capacitors are being used for filtering, and these capacitors are being used for storage. On the filtering side of things, we've got to look at impedance. And of course, the impedance equation itself is always the reactance and the resistance. For now, let's just look at the reactance side of it. For a capacitor, it is 1 over J omega C. And just as a quick review of our, our uh, EE uh, undergraduate days, omega equals 2 pi frequency. As Z approaches 0, then obviously, or for Z to approach 0, because we're dealing with stuff that's in the denominator, we've got to make the denominator larger. And we can do that by making the C larger, right? the capacitance larger. So therefore, again, it looks like C, a larger C would be ideal. And again, we push this in theory. So, so far, everything I've talked about kind of indicates that the bigger capacitors we put on this thing, all the better. Well, let's talk about reality. Larger capacitors are actually very problematic. And we need to look at the real model of the capacitor over here. So in the real model, and I do apologize if I butcher this a little bit, I've been calling these, the, uh, instead of the equivalent, the effective series, but actually uh, the equivalent series inductor. Um, and so if I do call it the effective, and I'm, I'm actually talking about the equivalent series inductance. But really what the point is here is that each capacitor does have an inductance to it. And it also does have a resistance to it. It actually has two resistances. The leakage one's always going to be there. This one over here is actually a little more um, prevalent uh, that we have to worry about. And, or you'll see its impact here uh, in a couple of slides from now. This ESL over here becomes problematic in high-speed design. We're going to see this time and time again as we move along here. You just got to remember something, that we're dealing with electromagnetic waves. And even though we're always talking about capacitors, and obviously the electric wave or the E field is the one that's most prevalent, we, we cannot just say that there's no M field or magnetic field to it. And that's what we're seeing is that the magnetic field does play a role. And it's amazing how big a role it plays, even though we're dealing with capacitors um, in the higher speed and the higher frequencies. Okay. There's also the equivalent series resistance. And we just, again, have to go back to that idea that there is no zero ohm material out there. It always has uh, some type of uh, ohmic value to it. And again, it's, it's an impedance uh, because there's both a resistance and a reactance to it. So just got to realize that that does exist in there, uh, and it's going to play a role. It's, it, you'll see it in what's called the resonant frequency in just a moment. And obviously, there's a leakage resistance as well. No capacitor, once it's charged, is going to hold its charge forever. There's always going to be some type of uh, leak to it, though they're getting much better at uh, reducing this more and more all the time. So let's go back to the capacitors. As I showed you uh, earlier, and we talked about the impedance, we got to kind of rethink this here. Originally, I said that the C needs to be larger. And as we look at the model, that's not the case. But we do have omega in here. And omega is 2 pi f. So we have a frequency. Okay? And we can use that frequency actually to our advantage in capacitors. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So therefore, the smaller capacitors are actually effective at high frequencies. Because this is going to drop off to pretty much nothing as the frequency gets larger. So that's fine. And that's, that's good, too, because now we're not worried about this capacitor, uh, this, this capacitor over here, this value, pardon me. Uh, it's fixed. And on our boards, we couldn't adjust that anyways. We just got to pick a value. But if we're going to go to a higher frequency, that certainly helps us with this here. And that's really what you're going to find here as we're going about, is that everything really has to do with the impedance aspect of the capacitors. All right. Very, very quick. I know we showed this last month, and I think we even showed it again a couple of uh, seminars ago. But I think it's really important for us to talk about it because this thing of reactance is kind of tough for a lot of us to get our heads wrapped around. We're so used to resistance. And then we hear this thing called impedance, and then we kind of lock up and say, well, ah, I don't really understand the impedance thing. But just always remember that impedance is resistance and the reactance. And the resistance is always easy because it's, frequent, it's frequency independent. 
it doesn't matter what the frequency is, the resistance is always going to remain the same. The reactance is always going to change due to frequency. Why is that? Because the field changes cause the reactance, right? When we charge up a capacitor and we charge down a capacitor because of the field, uh, it doesn't do it instantaneously, the fields are changing. That's the key point here. So for example, for a capacitor, we create an electric field because we're, set, we're setting up, we're, we're basically providing charge onto the charge plate. And as that voltage changes, the E field is going to change. But again, it doesn't happen simultaneously. It happens over time. And that is the reactance to the voltage. In a very similar fashion, the same thing happens with inductors. It's just instead of with the E fields, we're dealing with the magnetic field. And again, when these things change, uh, they're going to change over time. What's interesting about both of these over here, and let's take a look at these equations here, is that with the capacitors, as the frequencies get larger, this actually becomes less of an issue. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. You're not trying to, you're not spending a lot of time charging up and discharging a capacitor because, quite frankly, at larger frequencies, it doesn't have a whole lot of time to do any of it. As fast as it's charging up, is probably just as fast as discharging it. So th this impedance really uh, becomes um, negated. The uh, but on the other hand, the impedance over here, well, uh, of, of the inductance, it's going to go up because obviously this is the numerator, so mathematically that makes sense. But why is that happening on our board? Well, you got to remember we're dealing with high frequencies, and magnetic frequencies do not like to uh, change very quickly. They can handle at lower frequencies, but at high frequencies, magnetic fields don't handle that very well. They, they actually take a, long, they take a longer time to change. So that's why this inductance over here becomes kind of problematic. Uh, in the higher frequencies. So just want to throw this out over here. I can't drive this, emphasize this point enough to you that, look, we're dealing with noise. It's either voltage or it's uh, a, a current. And we want to get this off of our power plane because we want our power plane to be DC. But we can't do it if this is high. And if this isn't high, we're going to get EMI. Or pardon me, if this is very high, we're going to get EMI. We want to get this one to be as small as possible to avoid EMI altogether. So it's really an understanding of dealing with the impedance when we're dealing with high speed uh, and the noise that's on the voltage planes. All right, how do we do that? Well, there's a graph that we can use. Maybe you haven't seen this before. You haven't seen this in a long time. But there's basically impedance versus frequency. And what you're going to see here, again, if we look at our equations, is there's kind of three aspects to this particular graph. The first aspect is that we have our impedance due to the capacitor or the capacitive um, impedance. Okay? The, um, and what we're seeing over here is this line. This line ultimately represents the impedance as we go through the frequency. But as the frequency goes, gets larger, obviously this is going to become smaller. Okay? And it's going to keep on getting down to a point over here. And they call this the resonant frequency. Now, if we could get rid of the inductance, and trust me, they're spending a lot of time on this, because if we want to get into the double digit gigahertz range type of stuff, uh, they're going to have to have products that are going to handle that a little bit better than what we've got now. But the fact of the matter is, is that if uh, we got to this resonant frequency and we had no ESL here, this would flatline. Because again, we've got, this, uh, we've got resistance. Now this is probably well less than an ohm here. However, um, it, it's, it's still there. Okay? And we just, we just can't ignore it. This is not zero. It will never be zero, unfortunately. Well, never is a tough word. Uh, knowing some engineers out there, they might get it very, very close to zero. But right now, there is definitely um, some, there's some, some value to this here. The point is, is that once we get beyond here, now all of a sudden the capacitive effect has gone so low that it's not playing a role in here. But of course, their equation over here, the inductive for the uh, in, inductive effects, basically our impedances are starting to go back up. All right, so that's where we put this over here. Is that for the capacitor, uh, we're dealing from this point over here, we're dealing with the capacitance effects. Over here, we're dealing with the inductive effects uh, of it. And pretty much every capacitor uh, shows this. And what we, where do we want to work? Ultimately, we want to work over here in the sweet spot, the resonant frequency, where the impedance is the lowest, especially for uh, using these for filtering. Okay. All right, let me bring up the tool here at this point in time. So we've got this up over here. And I wanted to show an example of, uh, of an ex example of a capacitor they pulled out of the library. So this is the ICD tool. We are in the PDN planner. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, numbers over here. I'll talk about these a little bit later, because these relate to how you'd set up your board. What's nice about the tool is that it can take the board information, and it can add it into the capacitors that you have selected over here. But for now, let's not worry about this. Let's strictly use this for the purposes of impedance versus frequency. 
and we're just going to take a look at one particular capacitor. There is a capacitor library in here, by the way. It's just simply a matter of right-clicking here, uh, inserting it below, and, or you'll bring up the library, and then you insert it below uh, whichever one you select. So I've already got a couple of them here just to kind of keep things moving along. Here's capacitor C1. All right, there's quantity 1. Here's its value at the point uh, 1 microfarad um, uh, capa capacitor over here. And here we see the classic line happening here again. So there's a couple of questions you may have for yourself over here, and that is, well, uh, for example, what happens if I, instead of purchasing this 0.01, I point, pick up another one that's got less of what they call an ES, uh, less ESR, something that's got a smaller resistance to it? Well, let's take a look at that here. So I'm going to change that up. So I actually, the original one had one that was much less than this. But it's, as I said earlier, they all do have it, but they're not that severe. Okay? And when we do that here, you'll see that it's now dipped down much further. Now, you may say to yourself, well, that's pretty good. What if I was to add more of the same type on there? Because a lot of times what we try to do is you know, keep our lives simple. We don't want to create more library parts. And we don't want to have a bigger bill of materials. So we say, well, uh, I just want to put on as many of these things as possible. And will that re remedy the problem? Well, let's take a look. So I'm going to turn on C2. And C2 represents the same capacitors above. It's just that now I'm doing quantity 5 rather than quantity 1. So I'm going to turn this one on over here. And you are going to see three lines. The blue is the original. So this is what happens when you have 1. You see the green over here, which is what happens when you have 5. And then you've got this dark line, or this red line, which we're going to see quite often here. And that's kind of a summary of all of them. So this is what you get when you have all six of them together. So the big thing you need to notice here is, yes, the impedances are dropping when you do have more of them over here. But it's not shifting our, our, our basically our resonant frequency to the left or to the right. The resonant frequency is very, very much dependent on your ESR, which again is your equivalent series resistance. Okay. And as a matter of fact, if I turn on C3, which represents 20 of these over here, we'll see another line. Okay. I'll hit enter to get it locked in. And yeah, it dropped it down even further. But now you're talking about a lot of capacitors, and it's doing an OK job, but maybe we need to have some different values to it as well. So that's what I wanted to show over here. And, um, and again, this is pretty much the same one that you just saw. Now, because we saw that, and I just mentioned we should probably use different capacitors, we need a plan of action for this. And the plan of action is to ride the resonant frequencies. Okay? And as I mentioned, the resonant frequencies are always your lowest point on each one of your capacitors that you have. Okay? And when we look at this over here, we're trying to use not just the capacitors, but we're also going to take advantage of what they call the VRM, which is really your power supply. So your voltage regulator module is your power supply. And your power supply, again, because it has a regulator, can definitely handle the lower frequencies. On the plane, believe it or not, our board itself and the higher frequencies actually comes to our aid as well, which is kind of a nice feature. So our board is not necessarily an enemy to us. It's actually a friend to us uh, in, in the high speed area, which is good. Now, beyond that over here, um, there are going to be things, but we're not talking about double digit fr uh, gigahertz frequencies at this point. Let's just talk about those things that are in the um, in the hundreds of megahertz of frequencies. What are we trying to take advantage of? Well, the, the way we are trying to do this is we're trying to take advantage of these resonant frequencies, which again are the lowest impedances. And what's kind of cool about this is that as we put all these different things on here, we can definitely do that. We can ride these things. Obviously, it would be nice to have a straight, flat line here, which is the ideal line. But even if we can keep this as close as possible to that line with these little bumps, uh, it's fine as well. But how, how can we do that? What, what's the science behind that that allows us to do it? Well, go back to the equivalent series resistors that are in all the capacitors. Well, what are we doing with all the capacitors? We're putting them in parallel to each other on the board. Okay? We're putting them one on the, on the voltage, uh, on the supply side, and we're putting one on the ground. So put aside for a minute the capacitive aspect of it and just look strictly at the impedance aspect of it. Well, what happens when you run two resistors in parallel and one's really small? and one's really huge. Well, guess what happens? When, when you do that, the answer is generally going to be 1 ohm. Okay? It's almost going to completely avoid the 1 mega ohm side here. Well, we're taking advantage of that, just that we're doing it on the reactant side. So for example, if we follow this along, as the impedance is going higher, 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 and higher, well, at this point over here, the VRM is not of much help to us. But guess what? Our bulk capacitors at that point start to assist us over here. And again, we want to use the lower, we're going to use the lower impedance because it's in parallel, right? Because they're all, again, going from the, the supply to the ground. 
and so it's going to go there on the uh, bypass, follow the bypass capacitor. And at some point after the bypass capacitor, its inductance is going to become too much, and the decoupling capacitors are going to start to kick in. And after the decoupling capacitors, their inductance has become too much, the plane will actually kick in at that point in time as well. So that's the plan of action. So obviously we need to have different values of capacitors uh, to do this. So let me bring up our tool here again, and I'm going to bring up a different um, set of these. So let's uh, close this one, and we'll bring this one up. And what I did is I took a bunch of Kemet components. All right. All right, so I've got these. Oh, let me switch over my, um, I think I left this in a state last time. So let's switch this over here. So I've got this here, and I am going to turn off these here for a moment. I should not have saved those with those turned on. So let's not worry about the plane of the VRM for a moment. Kind of took away some of the surprise for you over here, but that's OK. At this point in time, what we're looking at here is we are looking at just the capacitors themselves. So what I've done, and let's scroll these down, is I've got uh, seven capacitors that are turned on. Some of them have a bigger quantity than others. So let's change those over here to one, okay? just to kind of keep it as pure as possible. Because what I want to show you is what happens okay, when we just start throwing these capacitors on here. Because what I'm saying so far is that you don't want to just use one type of capacitor. You want to use different values for those capacitors. And they should all kind of line up and work with each other. Isn't that not what we would expect? Well, let's take a look over here. But first and foremost, understand this. These were all selected. They were basically, I picked one representation of these Kemet parts uh, for no other reason of using other than this. I found the Kemets in the library, so I used them. What I want to do is to show you what happened as we went from a 10x from one to the next to the next. There's only one between C2 and C3 I couldn't find, so that's why you see this particular gap over here. Okay. So, and by the way, I'm going to drop this down over here. This is showing 100 gigahertz. We probably don't need to go up that high. So I'm going to drop this down here and tab this over. Okay. So we're at 10 gigahertz, which we may still need to look at for our harmonics purposes. But you can see over here, here's our highest capacitance. And that's against the small, pardon me, the, the capacitor over here dealing with the highest frequencies, but it's also the smallest of the capacitors. And then if we go over here to C2, you can see this one over here as well. And interestingly enough, they do space themselves out rather nicely. And again, obviously, there's a gap here because there was no value between C2 and C3. But as we go down, you can see them all play here. Now, initially, when you look at the lower frequencies, it does what we were kind of seeing in the last slide. Here's this uh, capacitor here, C7. And if C7 was kind of coming, coming up over here, and it would have followed its trend, the other one kind of comes in and it says, look, I can take care of this. i got a lower impedance. So it rides it nicely. And we just see the same thing between C6 and C5. But between C5 and C4, hey, we've got a spike over here. It's not following the rules that we saw down here. And they seem to be more uh, exaggerated as we get further up here in the higher frequencies. So what gives? Why all of a sudden uh, is the theory that was working down here not working up over here? Well, it's an important thing to understand because a lot of times the only th we do something which is almost worse than just throwing the same capacitor down, we throw down capacitors without thinking of the values that we're going to be putting down. And these things are called anti-resonant peaks. And it has to do with the values that we do select and the frequencies we're working at. I'm going to read this to you. I'm not a big fan of reading this, but I'll, I need to read to you because I want you to I kind of absorb it, and then I'll break it down here so that you can uh, understand what we're talking about. The anti-president uh, peak is a frequency in which the bulk capacitors, ESL, that is the equivalent series inductance, and the decoupling capacitor counteract each other, thereby knowing the ability to allow the AC noise on the voltage line a direct path to ground. And here's an example of what we're seeing over here. Just you got to keep in mind here that when we're talking about the bulk ESL, we are talking about all of the ESLs combined together from all the capacitors that are running in parallel on the board. And that's a lot of them. And you got to remember that, that that ESL is based upon certain frequencies. And so this is not all of the decoupling capacitors. This is just one particular decoupling capacitor. And this inductance over here can actually lock this one in such a way that it just won't work. What you get basically is an effect. You have a magnetic effect over here which prevents these, uh, the charging and discharging of these uh, charging plates. And so therefore, it actually spikes up. Or when you see the spike, you're basically seeing a much larger impedance that is necessary to overcome at those frequencies. And that's not a good thing. Again, we want to have zero ohm impedance as much as possible. 
And when you've got this type of situation going on, it effectively blocks the ability of the AC to go through this. Okay? So things that we have to understand is that just selecting capacitors at absolute random may actually undo the effort that you're trying to, to, uh, to, to, to address, basically. Uh, and then secondly, we've got to realize the board's inductive and capacitive effects are going to have a major impact on the capacitor's behaviors, right? And again, that's all these capacitors across it. We're talking about the bulk ESL, and the bulk ESL is, are all the capacitors running in parallel. And every time you put down a capacitor, you're adding to that, uh, th that pool of, of parallel capacitors. And we also have to realize that the harmonics must be understood because it may work fine for the frequency we plan on running our clock. But uh, obviously, with higher frequencies or just frequencies in general, they have these interesting things called harmonics, and they cannot be ignored. So let's bring back our tool here. Okay. All right, so let's bring this back on uh, over here. All right, and let's now turn on the capacitive effects here to take a better look at things and see what we can do. Um, first and foremost, let's go on up over here. We can define our plane one of two ways. We can either define it ourselves by uh, basically using these drop downs, but I'm going to basically use the stack up. So the stack up, if you use the stack up planner over here, all the information that you'd see over here would be propagated along. So it's actually going to be a lot more accurate. And I'm going to do this simply for an eight layer board. And that'll be fine. You'd notice that these are updating as we're putting this on. Um, secondly, uh, we're going to talk about the plane size. So this is just maybe a board size that you have. Obviously, you can adjust this. And if you're doing something in a very small area, you can uh, basically bring it down to that one area there to see what's gonna specifically going to happen uh, underneath it or within that area. For, for example, if you're trying to see what's going to happen in a, in, for a DDR3, and you want to see what's going on specifically in that area, you can actually bring it down to that size. What else do we have over here? Uh, we also have our VRM. We talked about this very briefly in the, uh, before. The VRM is the voltage regulation uh, regulator module, which again is your power supply. And so these are things that we need to set up. And this is really important to set up because ultimately this targets our frequency. So notice that the target impedance, not frequency, the, the impedance. Notice that this impedance over here, which is this line here, is something that we cannot adjust. It's only done through here because as far as it's concerned, the, tool is concerned, these over here are going to establish how that power supply and uh, the plane is going to uh, generally be uh, handled or how, it's, how much ripple and those type of things. So for example, if we have a 3.0 voltage here, and let's say we can go as much as 3 amps on this particular board. There's also a transient, which is saying like, well, how much time is your current actually switching? Well, if we're dealing with digital, we could probably say 50% of the time we're going to expect some type of current switch. And then in addition to that, there is also a, um, a ripple that we need to take into account as well. So I put it at 10%. Uh, so we could maybe experience ripple as much as plus or minus uh, 300 uh, millivolts on this. Now, is that extensive? That probably is. But again, you want to do things somewhat in a, uh, in a um, worst case scenario. So now that that's been set up, we know what our target uh, impedance is going to be. We want to try to get our impedances as close as possible as this. And when we look at what we've got right now, uh, and I haven't turned it on yet, but right now, based on what we've got here, uh, you know, the capacitors that have been selected so far, we're going to have some issues that are going to start to crop up a little bit over here at about 50 megahertz. And beyond that, we're definitely going to need to, to, to address this, especially if we're working, let's say, in 200, uh, 200, um, 200 megahertz, for example. And then from there, let's turn on the plane and let's take a look at what the plane does. Now, notice there's three of these here. And actually, before I turn on the plane, I'll turn on one other. But let me just talk about this one. If you have capacitance and you want to actually get down to the die level of it, you can turn this one on as well. We're not going to do that for this particular demonstration. But I am going to turn on this just to show it to you. So as I mentioned earlier, so let's hit return here. Okay, And let me bring this one down over to um, 0 0.01 so we can see it just a little bit better. Okay. So when we see this over here, if I'll turn this one back off, and you'll see a little bit more of a dramatic effect here, that without the, um, with, that this does play a role in this. And by doing that, it actually does help improve the overall impedance. Now, it was already below the line here already. But that was, that's fine. But we definitely want to keep it below this line, because the, the less impedance we're putting on that, all the better. That means that that AC noise can definitely go through from the power side to the uh, ground side without much of an issue. Okay. But let's take a look at these uh, higher things over here. Let's turn on the plane now and see what's going on. 
All right. So when we turn on the plane, it looks a little messy, but you also have to keep in mind that the plane is also represented by red over here and that the overall signal is represented by the deeper, uh, thicker red line here. To see this a little bit easier, I am going to basically, I am going to change the uh, frequency minimal here to uh, 500. Okay, so now we can take a look at this over here and get a kind of a better picture of uh, what's uh, going on. All right, so the F min and the F max over here is just a nice way of zooming in and zooming out on the chart. The key thing that we need to look at is what is our target frequency, and that's usually the clock speed that we're working at. So let's say 200 megahertz here, and that's what the black line is that we see. So at 200 megahertz, where most of our activity is going to be operating uh, for switching, is this good or not? Well, generally speaking, yeah, this looks pretty good. I'd be worried about this particular one here because it's well above one. Uh, and uh, I, maybe I am not working in frequencies that are particular, let's say, uh, 90 or 80 uh, 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 mega ohms. However, I don't know if I have that frequency or not on my, on my components. And so I, shouldn't, I generally would not want to leave this spike over here. What can we do about these things? Well, certainly one thing is we can add more quantity to them. And the second thing that we can obviously do is we can add more, um, we can add capacitance with other, free, uh, other capaci uh, capacitive farad, uh, let's try that again. We can add capacitors with different uh, far uh, farad values to them to help knock these down. Okay, so um, for example, and I'm going to bring this one up over here. Okay, if I want to bring in C8, so C8 over here was basically kind of a, a, a uh, a medium between C1 and C2, uh, actually C2 and C3, where C2 and C3 had that gap initially. So if I throw that one in over there, that will help out a little bit. So when I turn this one on, for example, um, oh, and I get to give it, and I let me turn off the loop inductance here. I'll talk about that one in a minute. When we turn that one on, for example, you'll see that these uh, did help improve that a bit. Now. What you're going to see in the higher frequencies, every time you put another capacitor down, you're still going to get a smaller anti-resonant peak. So those are the things you've got to worry about. Is that every time you put one of these down here in the high speed area, you're probably going to see two anti-resonant peaks that you put in there. But it's just, again, the idea is that you keep putting them in there to try to figure out how many of them you need and what different values you can get to this line as much as possible. Okay. So that's uh, just to give you an idea how to do that. And as I not sure unless you have a good feel for these type of things how you can kind of do that without necessarily looking at a chart uh, of this nature to do it but that's where that that tool is there all right so we took a look at these and you can see the differences uh, between the two so some other strategies that we need to take a look at here uh, very briefly is that yeah we can throw capacitors at this and that's what we've done and so at the end of the day we've got this and yeah we can play with some of these and we can change their values all right, maybe we make this one three here, and we see that that helped drop it down a little bit. Um, if we put a, one, a three over here, that's going to drop it down a little bit. We put a, you know, three of them here. And obviously, there's going to be more than one that we'd want to put there. And as we're doing this, we are dropping them down systematically. That's certainly one way to do it. The other thing we've got to be really careful about, and the tool does handle this, is we have to be careful about what they call inductive loops. So normally, what's going to happen is we're going to create a capacitor, or not create it, we're going to place down a capacitor and then after that, we're going to use vias to go to each one of the power planes. But depending on where we put the vias, that can actually create what's called an, a loop inductance area here, too. And we want to minimize this to the absolute uh, much as possible. Okay? So though we can't always do it, this is when we look at it from end to end, this actually creates the largest area uh, and creates the, the largest opportunity for loop inductance, where if we can get, get away with side to side, this actually dramatically reduces that loop inductance area. And even a D side over here will cut this side one in half. So these are things to think about. Now, if you're already doing uh, vias and pad, then you may as well do vias and pad for this as well. So don't do it for this necessarily. But if you're already putting a BGA down and you're going to do vias and pad, then shoot, you may as well do this for your bypass capacitors. And that will really, really bring it down. And here's uh, an extreme case. Uh, it was one that uh, my colleague was showing me that in a um, RF project that he was doing that he actually put two of these uh, vias uh, in pad on the on the pads themselves made sure obviously that, that there wasn't going to be issues with um, you know the breakthrough or any of those type of things like that the reason he did this was that you concentrated the loop inductance very very much into this one area over here and it wasn't going to radiate out uh, at all 
So why is that important here? Because it does have an impact and the tool can show us that. There's two features first. Uh, the first one is the via loop inductance. So well, how do we get the loop inductance? We basically need to know what side it's going to be on and we need to know the uh, package it's going to be used on. So let me give uh, the package over here for C8. Uh, this one happens to be an 0201, so I'm just going to add that in here. 0201, we'll put it on the top side. Okay, and then we'll talk about the fan out here, which is based on the via spreading, but we'll turn this one on. We'll just call it N for now. Okay. So when we turn on the uh, via loop inductance here, you see that there's now been a change. Okay, so now it's taking into account just the packaging and the side that it's in. But if we want to give it more detail, then we can turn on the uh, via spread here as well. All right, and now we said, I put these in the worst case scenario, so these are end to end. But if we start saying now, you know what, I want to use D side. Okay, I've got enough space for these D sides. You'll see that they'll slowly come down. I don't know if you saw it or not, but this, this particular one did drop down a little bit. And also keep in mind, I've got these sets of three uh, components. So there's a lot of factors here to play with, which is good. And we'll, I think that one's already set the D side. Let's set this one down to D side. And we may not be able to see the other ones because I'm already kind of zoomed in above megahertz, um, 100 megahertz. So we've got these things to uh, consider here as well. Uh, one thing I kind of skipped over in trying to show all this thing is we, this is where our resident or the frequency we're going to work at. Okay. I mean, this could be our clock frequency. Here are the harmonics. So we should look at the third, fifth, and seventh harmonic, and even the tenth harmonic, which is easy enough because of the 10x factor. So if we hit the uh, third harmonic over here, we see the red line, and this one's starting to approach one. It's okay, but maybe we do want to put either more capacitors here, see if we can find another value for this area. Here's the fifth harmonic. Fifth harmonic, again, is approaching one. Again, same recommendation. We may want to find different values, or we may want to find a different um, uh, capacitor, uh, uh, or add more capacitors to it. And then lastly, the seventh one here, it's not looking too bad. Of course, then there's the tenth one, so if this is 200, uh, this would be right over here. Um, if it's uh, 200 megahertz, this would be 2 gigahertz, which again, it's not looking too bad as well. So you want to take a look at those harmonics to make sure that uh, they're not going to play a, a role in this uh, in, in this issue. The only other one I definitely would want to do is I'd want to knock this one down here, and that would obviously be some of the lower capacitors that we would have to address uh, with that. Okay. All right. Let me just go to one other thing here. And the last thing uh, that I'll talk about is that obviously when we looked at this, what's causing all the problems in high-speed design with our bypass capacitors? It's our inductors, uh, it's the indu or the inductance aspect of the capacitors itself. The, the ESL is really causing a lot of problems, and especially once we start getting well beyond the single digit gigahertz range, we start getting into the double gigahertz range, we're going to have some problems with that. So there's been a lot of strategies. I, by the way, I was looking at I found about five or six of them, but a lot of them weren't, wouldn't be very effective. But one that I do believe will be effective is this one here, and it's called the interdigitated uh, capacitors. And the reason why is the way they set this up. And you can see an example of it here. They call them digitated because they basically are putting out little fingers on each side. And this is how they set it up. And because of this, they can actually get a very low inductance. And um, the interesting part about it is look at the size. They call them 0508. Basically, they're taking an 0805, and instead of using the uh, the short ends, they're using the long ends uh, to accomplish this over here. So definitely take a look at these uh, interdigitated uh, capacitors here if you're going to go into the higher, much higher frequencies, again, the gigahertz range, because these may be um, a solution uh, for you on that. So uh, that's, um, well, before I completely wrap it up over here, just want to provide a little bit more information. Uh, Barry is the owner of ICD, and if you're interested in uh, PDN planning articles, he's done a number of them here. Again, he's built this tool based on his knowledge. He's got over 30 years' experience in PCB design and well over 50 articles uh, on these particular subjects here. So I, it's kind of nice to have someone who's got that much expertise also put together a tool based on this expertise uh, as well over here. So uh, with that, um, that concludes our session.